Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. Coming to you this week from Studio City inside the Abattoir. I love that abattoir. It means meat grinder. <laughs> this is Score the Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Holmes, with my co-host, Robert Kraft. And whose studio is the abattoir, Kenny? Tyler Bates. Tyler Bates. An amazing conversation coming up with Tyler, with uh, a lot of excitement coming from the movies that he's gotten the A lot of pipeline. projects. A lot of projects. Got Deadpool in the 2. Yeah, Deadpool Just 2. Just around the corner. Uh, right. We're also joined by our executive producer, Matt Schrader. Hey, Matt. This is amazing. That's oh. our new drop. It's Robert. You now. If we ever need an extra little punch, oh, this is amazing. Oh, this is. <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh, this is amazing. I really like that. That could be my uh, ringtone. And we got Kenny too. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Not as excited. So, uh, I may. I actually added a, a couple good ones in the last week's episode. You might want to look. I I realized. I go Ooh, a lot, <laughs> which is kind of my. Well, we got it right there. <laughs> oh man! Uh, like we mentioned, we're here in the studios of Tyler Bates. Of course, he's worked with director Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead, Three Hundred, Watchmen, uh, James Gunn on Guardians of the Galaxy One and Two, and many other pictures. Uh, of course, he's also worked with Rob Zombie. Uh, he's done the John Wick films, Atomic Blonde, Californication on Showtime. Netflix, The Punisher. There's so many, so many projects. And then, of course, like uh, Robert mentioned, in just a couple of weeks, May 18th, Deadpool 2 coming out. Plus, he's toured with Marilyn Manson. I can't think of anything much cooler than that. Yeah, that's pretty badass. Yep. Um, also on today's show, a brand new episode of The Inside Track featuring music psychologist Dr. Sulan Tan from our documentary Score. Uh, her episode this week talks about the differences of music and noise and how we interpret the two. Mm, uh, and how they blend. Yeah, it's Pretty really, cool. really fascinating stuff. Plus, another chance for our audience to win a fabulous prize. We're going to play da, da, ba, da, da, da. Name That Score. <laughs> and uh, what's the topic today, Matt? Space movies. Ooh. Spaced out composers, that's our topic. <laughs> Spaced out Robert. <laughs> that's always a topic. <laughs> um, so Matt, you brought up, brought up this uh, topic that we're going to discuss um, earlier this week when it came out. It was uh, an article from Film Score Rejects kind of uh, putting in the ideas of who should score the next Bond film. They, they listed off quite a few and, and the reasons behind. David Arnold, of course, doing previous movies. Uh, Joe Kramer, Daniel Pemberton, Michael Levy. Cliff Martinez, John Bryan, um, and so we were we put up a uh, a poll on our on our Twitter feed to see what uh, people were thinking. Well, not a poll. We put up just you. It's not very scientific. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, kind of what some of the the popular opinions might be for people who you know, and it, it may not always be the best choice to be the next Bond composer, but uh, but. Yeah, I thought maybe we'll have a little uh, a little two round draft, and we'll see uh, pick a couple composers nice. we think might be fun to hear in the next Bond movie. Um, I know you guys have been throwing around some ideas, but um, eager to hear what you think, especially Robert. You know, you you have been involved in selecting composers for some different projects. So, what do you look for? Yeah, you in get someone are, is to he do getting the, sound the first of pick? James Bond. I want definitely getting the first pick. Um, <laughs> James Bond would be interesting. First of all, of course like any series or sequel you're going to be bound probably in James Bond more than any other to a certain legacy that you're inheriting and a certain certain tropes that are musically identified with the character with Bond as all that stuff that comes with it but um I thought about it. I really like the idea of Junkie XL Ooh. Tom Holkenberg. Is this your first selection? I think I think he'd be I know he'd knock it out. I mean, he's just great i also had another idea which i may surprise you with it would don't pick could, yet could change oh we gotta go we gotta go in rounds we're doing a draft here. are we oh, we right, can't that, pick two. that was the first overall pick junkie xl robert Kraft. The people seem to like that with pick. the first pick uh i'm Kenny's gonna, on the clock i'm gonna go um we know he's proven himself with some action sequences with uh one of the newer Star Wars and uh, Jurassic World. Um, he also can do the jazzy stuff, like with The Incredible. So I'm going to go with Michael Giacchino. Oh. Mm. Interesting call. All right. Am I part of this? Yeah. I, Why I got, not? Fire I got a away. couple. All right. I hope I'm not stealing uh, anybody from you guys. I'd love to hear John Powell. Oh. oh. Can't go wrong. Well, you could. You, he's done the Bourne stuff, so there's yep. the... the 
the badass mm-hmm. guy who doesn't die and can take but on he's also, 100 people at once. I think what he's done with, with Happy Feet and Ice Age, that really is <laughs> applicable. So, All right, Robert, second round. Big surprise, ready? You guys, you're seated, right? I was thinking about Trent and Atticus for a Whoa. James Bond movie. That That's could be, interesting. If they wouldn't object to bringing in some of the Bond thematic cues that might be necessary in a couple spots, I think they'd make it really modern. I love it. That would be really interesting. The edgiest Bond sound yet. Right on. Yep. Uh, I'm going to go with one of my favorite composers from our documentary. Um, she knows England. She's a brilliant composer. I'm going to say Rachel Portman. Love Rachel Portman. Oh. And they like British selection. composers. Yeah, they do. Yep. She's right down the street from David Arnold. Yeah. So maybe she could swing by, get a couple pointers about the James Bond themes. and We can't, uh, we can't end on mine, so we're going to have to, you guys will have to brainstorm one more pick. But uh, this, this may be a little, a little self-serving since we're uh, recording in the abattoir, but uh, a really cool sound given the John Wick sound, the Atomic Blonde stuff that Tyler Bates has done. Oh. I love that idea. I wonder if we can get him. <laughs> Tyler, <laughs> I did think. Tyler, if, would you do it? <laughs> I, I, I did think that if they got Trenton Atticus, it could be oh oh nine inch nails. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Should we end on that? <laughs> no. uh, huh. uh, it's kind of a thing I'm, I'm working on. I've been working on my material, so thank you. <laughs> oh, Very man. nice. Speaking of oh oh nine, did we solve it? Our James Bond choice or the draft? Did we? You get got, a first you got pick? any more picks? I think I think we got everybody. I wouldn't mind seeing Bear Bear McCreary jump in. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice. Play that little funky thing that he has. That that uh, <laughs> kind of wooden box. That's pirate there. pirate James Bond. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> I think it'd be cool. He's got a, a wide range. I think he could jump in there and do something really cool. Robert, you're talking about something else with the Oscars. They're they're changing part of their oh, format right. for score and song. Um. Can you explain how that works to some of us who who just see it as a, a big mystery box and we're not sure how exactly the different pieces work? We just together? tune in and see the names. We don't. Yeah, know. it's um, you know, it's voted on by the music branch. So the Academy has a number of branches: cinematographer, costume. The nominations are, and the nominations are exclusively the province of the music branch. Then it goes to the wider, entire Academy for the final votes but in the past you were sent an enormous list of the eligible songs and scores like 200 or something uh, right least. like a lot i mean and it was when it was a hard copy you got a folder in the mail of a huge list and you you know you go through the first page really i should say this i would go through the first page really diligently and the second page a little less diligently and then by page 11 you're kind of looking for your is friend, it really that friends. long oh it's a lot wow a lot of songs who in their Certainly. right mind can watch and listen to that much they would like you to they would like you to be completely informed and i think what happened or i know what happened is that in other branches of the academy the short listing approach has taken hold in the doc- which explain what a short list is so you it's you not have, a nomination it's right before that you do a first pass there's an interim step it's virtually between the 200 that you look at or the 100 however many it is and the five that are on your final ballot there's a short listing of please how many 15 15 so so this year for the first time in the music branch you'll get that initial list and then for those that have actually culled the most important scores you will get a list in december i believe because you vote at the end of january beginning of february maybe for the March telecast. Mm-hmm. It'll um, have those 15? You'll have the 15. Of, okay. Which I think is a real benefit to the members of the music branch because if you can't go through all 200, you're going to get 15 that are have been curated by the people that are really aware. So you of might listening. have some some uh, sleepers now, sleeper sleeper right. selections. So this, this, is, this is the new way. Yes. The old way was just huge list to nominees. Correct. And so the, the new one is now doing the shortlist, which is, which is what they, they do for the film 
the best film. Mm -hmm. A number of other uh, branches have adopted the shortlist possibility. And so music brands clearly thought there was a benefit to that. What, and what can this do? So let's say I'm a, a composer and I'm not John Williams, right. but I have a great score. Does this put me in front of people a little bit or give me the opportunity to get put in front of more people with the short list? Is that the idea? I think that if the great benefit would be if you ended up on the short list and you're not a famous and well-known composer, your star just rose enormously because you can bet that that short list of 15 will round up the usual suspects. So there'll be five or seven names on there that are, of course, going to be by major well-known you know i wish i could tell you that the voting process in any of these academy grammy golden globes is by merit of course you're looking for oh i didn't really listen carefully or see that but i love this guy's work or this woman's right i guess approach. you never know when you get into the subjective kind of the reasons people vote for whatever they vote sure. for it could be a number of factors. but not always merit-based going from 200 to five that's a lot to listen to. But if it goes from 200 to 15, you may, be, as a voter, be more inclined to listen to 15. I would. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think So you are good. getting some ears on it yeah. that maybe wouldn't. And per most, historically most uh, changes like this, there's going to be a lot of pushback. There's going to be some branch of the academy that will say, we liked it the old way and we're prepared for that. But I think that um, I'm looking forward to the 15. I really think that, Interesting. Is, that helps focus it. Cool. Uh, well, we've rambled on enough in front of him. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then after the break, Tyler Bates is going to join us. We're going to talk Deadpool 2, Watchmen, and even uh, yeah. him touring around with uh, Marilyn Manson over Sweet the years. Sweet dreams are made of this. Yes. Got a cool clip of that from Italian TV. Nice. Live Looking forward to that. Stick around. We will be right back. Hey, Mesh Raider here. We're back to the show in 15 seconds, but a quick thank you to everyone who's been telling a friend about Score the Podcast. We're one of the fastest growing entertainment podcasts out there right now, and that's thanks to you telling a friend. You're probably thinking of somebody else right now that enjoy the show. If it's safe to do so, hit pause and let them know about Score the Podcast. It helps keep this show going. Now back to the show. Welcome back to Score the Podcast. We're inside the abattoir, as Tyler Bates likes to call it. The meat grinder. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us, Tyler. Of course, uh, you know Tyler's music from Dawn of the Dead, 300, Watchmen, Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2, and uh, many, many other films, including uh, May 18th, the highly anticipated sequel to Deadpool, Deadpool 2. Uh, thanks for having us here so in your excited. studio. So excited. It is great, and yeah, actually, I'm lucky to be with Tyler because we've worked on a couple films together, so I've been in the studio with him up to our armpits and alligators, as they say, trying to, trying to get a movie finished. And uh, also, Tyler, well-known for his work with Marilyn Manson and yes. a lot of the rock music that is... It, and we'll get to rock that. Rock music sounds so old-fashioned. <laughs> a lot of the rock music that the kids like... Um, but I was really going, Tyler. Stuff. I was going through your bio, and this jumped out. You lived in a haunted cabin. You were a part of two exorcisms, <laughs> and you may have been a grave digger. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Where did it all begin, really? Oh well. Um, Which film was that? <laughs> I know. No, it's it's definitely uh, impacted my uh, my perspective over time. Uh, as I grew older, I realized how unusual my life was as a younger person but uh i'm from la i was born here but at some point uh, my family moved uh, outside of chicago and my mother was uh, she rode horses so we ended up uh, living on a ranch and um this log cabin was our house and it was nice but it was very dark and uh it was once owned by al capone so when we when we took ownership of it it had uh, some one-way glass windows and it had bookshelves that pulled out what? and there were small, small rooms behind bookshelves but it always had a very uh, odd energy and for about a year of living there we thought we were going crazy uh, because there were just too many oddities that were occurring and then we found out more about the history of the house and it led ultimately to uh, 
two separate exorcisms that were performed on the house, which only made things worse. <laughs> oh, so, man. Um, so it was a natural fit to score Rob Zombie movies. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. You know, the funny thing is, though, if you think about this, so this property, it was, it was a few acres, and it was all completely forested. And uh, when I was a kid, I'd have to, of course, among doing a million chores, I had to take out the trash. And oftentimes we'd, we'd eat dinner late. And if the trash was full at 8.30 at night and it was pitch black, my dad would make me take the trash out. Now, if I wanted to stash it, you know, around the corner of the house, <laughs> the raccoons he would tear get, it up. Oh, I'd get wow. my ass beat, you know. there was This was not, you know, this was pretty serious. So the trash bins were all in this old storage shed at the edge of the property. And so it's mm. probably about 50 yards away from the house in pitch black. And it, it, there was a padlock on it, and I had to go out there and undo the padlock. And then he, the doors would scrape open, and there was a window on the side of this thing. And I swear to God in my life, there was an old scythe that must have been 50 years old <laughs> hanging above that window. So you see this big, you know, sharp uh, blade hanging down. And I swear to God, I thought Michael Myers was going to come out and kill me, right? <laughs> oh, God. So I'd stash the trash in there, and I'd lock the thing up. And the funny thing is that I, I didn't realize until later on in life, I was running as fast as I could back into the haunted house to seek refuge. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, this sounds like a biopic that should be made. There is so much crazy stuff that happened. It's it's hard to even... I wonder if it affected the way you approached music, any of the scary stuff, because you did end up doing some of these really monstrous, dark pictures. Well, well disturbing, for sure. Disturbing, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know, I, I know what it feels like to have That's perfect. that in your mind. Um I, but I've always been a, a, a lover of music uh, it, of all varieties since I've been very young, and I did not grow up with the fantasy of scoring films. I didn't even consider it because I didn't think it was attainable. I just didn't even think it was a job <laughs> that I could ever ever uh, have. Tell me, how, how was there a, an epiphany at one moment where you said, you know what, film composing is my destiny, or how did that... I'd be curious to know, how did that evolve? Was there a movie opportunity that changed it? Um, it got me into it. I mean, music has always been my life, and yeah. I never had a backup plan. Um, so when I moved back to Los Angeles in the early 90s, uh, people you know that I'd meet at parties or whatever would, would be directing their, their Corman movies and their Saban movies, and they had very little resources for music and they'd ask me if I'd do the music and you know I was painting houses too so I'd mm. be like all right well that's one less house to paint if I do this movie yeah. but the great thing about it was is I learned uh, my initial vocabulary and understanding of the business from directors producers editors and re-recording mixers so instead of learning from another a composer yeah I understood how music functions in the the entire strata of filmmaking and where what its true importance is and what its motivation is and how is a director thinking about music you know it's really all about storytelling and emotion you know so you may come out of music school with a more um let's say myopic uh, perspective on what music is about and that you're going to write these fantastic musical uh, tunes and gestures to uh, to you know pictures, but it it's really not that job. I think that's fantastic because it really you're shining a light on the composer as one of the filmmakers. Definitely, and a lot of composers think that they're just the musician who's brought in to put the icing on the cake. But you aren't, you know, depending on how aware the director is of the music's part in the movie, because sometimes directors think about that too, just come in and help me. Some directors, of course, bring the composer in and say, help me tell this story. And you knowing that from the jump has got to be a huge asset. Yeah, and it's it's exciting to me. I, uh, I learn a lot on every project I do, uh, just because everybody has a different perspective on storytelling, and they relate to different types of situations uh, emotionally, um, different than I do. So over the years, I've learned, you know, instead of judging a person, I my job is to understand a person. So I don't look at people as being weird or anything. You know, I'm just trying to understand where they're coming from and, under, and also know that they have a life experience that is informing the way they want to tell a story. 
So it's important for me to be perceptive of that and, um, and to make sure that that's a, a primary uh, component of, of the score. It's not just my own subjective taste. I have to create something in musical language that is is really with the director's voice um Hang on. they clearly <laughs> think that i'm available to talk you're, you're while witnessing I'm during... you're witnessing a phone call he's probably getting another big film job right it. now breaking news look at that it's a heavy duty call and <laughs> we're in the middle of this is real. We are not. In this is any how you know this is an uncut show. Our show. right now, Tyler. Welcome back to the uh, show. I apologize, Tyler. <laughs> you were speaking about um, how you have to read. You know, almost be a therapist with your composer, and certainly try and deduce in the musical language what people are feeling. You said you don't judge it. There are, however, musical subtleties to what you just said. And for a film like Deadpool, Deadpool is both an action film and a superhero film and a dark film, but it also has this kind of subversive comic element. So there's a real challenge for a composer to be all the things that you need to be for the kind of film that it is in one way, which is driving dark action, but also have a kind of wink at the audience. And that's a musical subtlety. Is it hard to embrace both? in one movie score, some are comic and some are dark, this one has to be both. Uh, absolutely. I, I would say it's uh, one of the the most challenging films I've worked on. Hmm. And the reason being is, A, there's a, there are a ton of musical references through songs in the film. Any bit of score is going to impact the dialogue. And Ryan's dialogue is uh, was evolving and the timing was evolving. So the picture's changing quite a bit. And everything that you do when, when there's a, you know, when you get a new cut of a picture and there's some new jokes in there, new dialogue, you have to rethink the score and how is it impacting the dialogue. Because in that movie, the dialogue is the king. Can you talk a little bit about the, I don't think I've ever heard a composer be that specific about the relation of dialogue to score. When you say every bit of score impacts the dialogue or vice versa, are you talking rhythmically or just you need to hear the line so you have to go down under it sonically or mix-wise? What are you referring to when you say that? Well, I think tonally. For instance, if I were to do, say Keanu Reeves was not starring in John Wick, it was a different actor, the music would be different mm. because the the timbre of his voice would be different the body movements would be different and the music has to suit that but when uh, I'm working on a score I'm thinking of the dialogue almost as you would a melody uh, like a lead vocalist in a song fantastic so, so you're not just scoring the action on the screen but you're listening for what they're talking about and Absolutely, and then you you want to you want to create music that's complementary to where the actor's voices fall in the tonal range, so that it's most effective. That's um, just you know, and that's again, that's an evolving endeavor with any movie today, because now that we're completely in a digital realm, um, the pictures are changing all the time and and if you want to be an effective composer and you want to keep your job <laughs> you need to stay current with the the pace of the film as it's as it's uh, going through its permutations you actually said as we were just chatting a bit before we started to record you said something i said stop i'd like to ask you about this subject on the podcast you said the business has changed so much since we first you and i first worked together which we worked together in the early 2000s and then again in 2008 and i thought save it because i have a lot of ideas about what you might mean but i don't want to presume that the way i think it's changed is the way you think it's changed can you speak about a little bit about what has evolved while you've been composing films uh sure and i've, I've been a couple generations in now but 
you know, change is, is good no matter what, and it's natural in life. So I've seen a lot of musicians, artists, whatever, a little bit disenfranchised because they didn't seem to evolve with change. Mm-hmm. Um, change is something you need to accept and in order to adapt well to it. So it's harrowing sometimes with how quickly a picture can change its structure, how the narrative can be impacted by, let's say, an epiphany with uh, the meeting between the studio and a director or a test, you know, a test screening that might shed some light on something that would be an important storytelling point. Um, That all impacts the score. So the the tempo which we have to create and then recreate and recreate and then at the end produce the final product is enormous. There were movies that... uh, well, Dawn of the Dead, I actually did pretty quickly for for myself at that time. It was only a few weeks. Hmm. But 300, I was working with them for a year and a half before they got a deal. <laughs> and then they shot to some music. Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, James Gunn usually will have me write music for a few months before he films and then during filming. Does he listen to that while he's filming? The actors, cinematographers, everybody. They digitally, digitally remove the earbuds from their ears in those wow. sequences uh, afterwards. <laughs> um, but what what that allows us to do, considering how uh, frenetic the process can be in post-production, it allows us to establish what is the language of this film. So we don't have the what is it being determined in post-production. We already know what we feel the language of the film that's or the amazing. syntax is. That's, so, so, that's really radical... It's also a throwback. I mean, I think Nino Rota wrote music and gave it to Fellini, who I think he just listened to it while he was shooting or the night before, and you hear that it informed the way he felt about the next day's shoot. But actually having score for actors, is that's so cool. Yeah. It's really good. And, and actually the first time I showed up to the set on Guardians 1, uh, Chris Pratt was the first person I ran into, and he he had commented immediately he says dude it was so awesome shooting to music he said it just put me right in the film i bet and you know the directors nowadays on these movies that are massive uh have very little time like james gunn and i don't hang out in my studio like we once did um so in order for me to have a connection with him throughout the film i think some of the the development of music before and during production is something that stays with him a lot more so we're already in another phase of the conversation, you know, once we get into post production, and he has very little time to spend with me, uh, and I get it. You know, there's a gazillion visual effects. They're doing pickup shots or reshoots or whatever's going to happen over the course of a few. It months, also but. saves the shock that happened. Of course, it's happened to you. It happened to me a lot. Which is when the studio sees the film for the first time with the new music. They've either heard a temp Mm -hmm. or they've heard no music, and they're like, what is this? It hasn't settled yet that this is the voice of the composer, this is the sound of the film. If there's a little bit of pre-production on the music, you've saved that. Speaking of Guardians of the Galaxy, Matt, do you have a Guardians clip? I sure do. This is the uh, theme, I think, from the end. Yeah. It's a great theme, great, great Marvel theme. Thank you. Oh, it's beautiful. So uh, when you're working on a movie like Guardians, which has so much of a soundtrack, there's all these popular songs. Uh, the mixtape is a big character in the in the movie, so to speak. Um, how does that impact your score? Are you, are you battling with the director? Not battling in a bad way, but, you know, original score would be better here instead of a song. Or how are those conversations? How do those go? Is the, are the songs set and then there's just spots for score or do you find your way to, to make spots where there was a popular song and now there's score in there because you had a better idea? And have you ever won one of those? <laughs> First <laughs> off, the there, there, there is no argument that <laughs> okay. is won, period. Um, look, I, I believe that I can't tell another person what to feel in life. So for instance, say I got a cue kicked back that I loved, but a director is just not feeling it. I can't tell him to feel it. (laughs) It's like, okay, that's a challenge. I'm going to see if I can really get inside of their heart, their mind, and then create something that is going to evoke the feeling that they're looking for. Um, That's 
important. Now, when, you know, Guardians, those songs are written into the script. You know, James is very detailed about how he feels uh, the, the movie with these songs. They're, they're definitely uh, conceptualized together. So I have a great deal of respect for his sensibilities with music, and my job is to bring his his vision to fruition musically, right? So yeah, there's of course some experimentation, and sometimes I will want to, you know, throw my uh, forearm into the music process a little bit, and I might surprise him and bring a whole rig of stuff to play live in one of our meetings at Marvel. Like I'll play, mm. I'll play a guitar viol live to picture where we've never scored it yet, and I'll say, check this out. You nice. know, so what what I want to do is to remind remind everybody involved of the the soul and the excitement of the creation of music because they're just used to stuff showing up in computers and being cut up and thrown around and along the way so i think it's very important to keep the soul and the spirit of of music creation alive in that conversation what, that is so what about great. do you add do you ever add to a popular song like let's say it's a great song for the scene but maybe you feel it needs a little more rhythm or a little more heart pumping feel to a, a you know a song that doesn't bring that well in guardians too uh james asked me to do kind of an overlay to come a little bit closer so it kind of it, it sort of trans uh it trans transcends into this other headspace um that is more of, of an overview of what's going on so it, it creates like a montage moment and then when we shrink back into the song we're back into reality nice. so those kind of challenges are great and i do i love segues um something like deadpool is different because a lot of the songs you know when they stop uh can be almost like a record scratch because there's an interesting dialogue that occurs you know so that is that that's just a real job like to go in and just make sure that the music is functioning in an appropriate way for the film yeah you know guardians is more sweeping orchestral beautiful music deadpool is a different type of a thing i'm really proud of the score but its function is entirely different than a score for guardians of the galaxy it's amazing to hear you say it i'm not sure why other than the subtlety of your perception of those two approaches and score and artistic activity is really interesting and great because I think an outside observer would say, it's your next movie, it, you're just knocking it out, and Guardians is more similar to Deadpool than Guardians would be to some searchlight sweet film. But you're saying it's really different jobs, and I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I do, it's not my business what people think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just I try That's and, the healthiest thing we can all <laughs> take away. No, I just try this. and try and do the the best most appropriate job I can on each film and and a huge part of that is providing an experience that's unique for everybody involved. Fantastic. You know, we we have to find that magic moment where music is the central aspect of what what our point is that day or what have you and I, I always want to create a moment somewhere along the way where people are going to remember it for their life you know so um we we try and do that that's the fun and the wonderment of of music that can be lost in the stress and the pressure of trying to get it done coming up after the break we're going to talk to tyler about what it's like touring around the world as a rock star but first the inside track the inside track with music psychologist Dr. Sulan Tan. The film Cinema Paradiso ends in this way. What's the last sound we're left with? Is it music or is it noise? After all, the sound of an old film projector, which is what you just heard, has many of the same qualities as music. There's a rhythm to it, and the regular vibrations give it a somewhat discernible pitch. It's these musical qualities that first got the attention of Ben Burt, the sound designer for Star Wars. He was listening to the sounds that are inside the projector, the running motor, and described it as, quote, a musical hum. This musical hum was the inspiration for the sound of the lightsaber. Ben Burt hears the musical qualities of sounds that many of us aren't attuned to thinking of 
as music. From the perspective of my field, dealing with the perception of sound, we often say that fundamentally we can't really draw a sharp distinction between music and noise. Sometimes we'll say musical sound is more orderly, noise is more untamed. But when you strike an unpitched drum, you produce an irregular sound pattern that is similar to that created by a door slam or an explosion. Composers have to be particularly attuned to the whole spectrum of sound. Many composers toe the line between music and noise, combining elements of musical and non-musical sounds in their scores. Think of Gershwin's An American in Paris, which included real car horns. Or Respighi's Pines of Rome, which included this recording of a real Nightingale song. A recent example is Bear McCreary's score for 10 Cloverfield Lane. Much of this film takes place inside a bunker, deep underground. To give the claustrophobic feeling of a subterranean bunker, Bear McCreary used materials inspired by the movie set, including buckets, barrels, chains, glass, and power tools. He asked people to play them like percussion instruments and recorded the sounds to incorporate into the score. Here are some of the raw sounds. And here they are, integrated into the score. In this part, we hear a big barrel made out of metal being struck over and over. Noise transforms into music and finds its place in this score. You can read more about Bear McCreary's process in his intriguing blog, Black Sales, which, by the way, is required reading in my Psychology of Creativity class. Composers have a real affinity with sound in its various forms, and their imaginations stretch beyond the conventional boundaries often drawn between music and noise. Perhaps we could all take inspiration from the musical qualities of sounds around us. Rain falling on the roof, pots and pans rattling in the sink, or the whirring of a film projector. Dr. Su Lan Tan is a leading researcher in the study of film music and the author of many books, including her latest, Psychology of Music, From Sound to Significance, available now at score-movie.com slash podcast. Sweet dreams are made of these Who am I to disagree Welcome back inside the studios with Tyler Bates here. And that was a little clip from uh, you playing with Marilyn Manson in Italy. Yeah. Do you remember that night? Where were you that night? I do. We were uh, we were in Rome. Um, we flew from somewhere else on a charter to go and do that thing. But uh, So we we did it acoustically. He was being interviewed on this this show, and it's actually where Fellini used to shoot all his movies. And they turn a cheetah. Yeah, they turned this into a soundstage with full LED walls and everything. It was awesome. So for the Manson segment, they converted the place into a Gothic church. It looks so cool. We'll put the (laughs) uh, clip on our on our landing page. It's so cool. So the funny thing is, they have a house band slash orchestra with a conductor, and uh, they have to be part of the performance in some way. Well, they they had the band learn like the heavy version of the song, and I heard a demo of it. And I'm like, no, <laughs> not gonna happen. So, uh, so when we got there, you know, I had to talk to the conductor, and I said, look, we're gonna let's just do something with the orchestra. Let's do something like this, and I'll cue you when the time comes. Okay, just wait for me, and I'll cue you. So. Uh, you know, because you never know what the arrangement's going to be when Manson and I play together acoustically. He may want to draw something out a little longer, and he knows that I'll just circle back around and pick him up for the Is next. It just verse. the two of you? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, uh, that happened, and this is you know, this is a town where the Vatican is, <laughs> and so <laughs> the part they showed on camera was us playing "Sweet Dreams," and then we had a. a 
we have a song from the latest record called Heaven Upside Down, and this, the song itself is called Say Ten. We were going to call Ooh. the record Say Ten because it's the 10th record, you know? Yeah. Um, so Fitting. So the chorus is you say God and I say Satan. And <laughs> so we started playing an acoustic version of that and we're talking like 1,200 people in there, kids, elderly people, oh, in God. between, Manson fans the are Pope. all chanting as loud as you can imagine, you say God and I say Satan. It was hilarious. you know. So there's about 4 million experiences like that I've had, which has made it, made it good fun. You guys connected on Californication on the set, if I read that correctly, yeah. Um, how did that come about? Do you just how do you bromance with Marilyn Manson out of the gate? <laughs> What's the pickup line? I don't. <laughs> I don't know. We we had a very we you know we had a slightly contentious uh, introduction. I was hmm. I was a little tired and and irritated by the time I had met him. But um, we had to perform together because the final episode of season six was a wedding that was filmed at the Greek theater. And so Tom Kapanos wanted to turn it into a concert. So they brought in a couple thousand extras and then Manson wanted to perform and Steve Jones performed and uh, Tim Minchin. So it was a full on concert. And um, I don't know, when Manson and I played in front of an audience, he just, uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, felt that we had a chemistry and then I spoke to him uh, two days later we did a rap party so we did another concert and we talked about getting together and potentially doing some work uh, on some music and it took about a year we did another performance together and then we finally got together and started uh, The Pale Emperor I mean we didn't get together to make a record we just got together to to have a conversation and music and to see what would happen and it just was very natural. And Does he I, think about, I'm sorry. No, I think my work with directors and studio executives over the years uh, definitely helped me have a very effective collaborative relationship with him. And oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's a, you know, again, I'm, my job is to understand him for who he is now and, and, what's the story that needs to be told that's going to be interesting you know so i wanted to sort of cleanse uh cleanse the palate of the the mansonisms that i think that people he might have been working with were were just bringing to the table because i think that's what it's supposed to be and and uh i think he wanted to eschew some of that and turn the page and see you know what he was capable of now and so that led to these two records and it was uh it was more than interesting has what? he ever been interested in film scoring? That was, that's what I was going to ask. It's funny. Is he and, musical and, in that way? You know, or? do one of those things where Tyler Bates and Marilyn Manson score, you know, a movie the way Daft Punk did a movie with a composer and M83 um, did a movie. Does Manson ever say, let's do that together? Oh, he would do it in a second. But I grew up in a haunted house and now you're describing my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, great. You know, Manson and I are great in the studio together <laughs> writing songs. And we laugh. We have a lot of fun, and we we definitely push each other to uh, to really just you know see what our creative capacity is at the time. And you know what he's he's brought out a lot of very good things in me that has relieved me of some of the let's say the anxiety or or, or whatever is pent up that I don't get a, through scoring films or television as an artist. I've been able to do that through working with artists that really began with him a few years ago. And so it, it's important as a film composer, as a TV composer, as anything, to know that you can't necessarily satisfy every bit of your creative aspirations through that medium because you're a commissioned artist. It's your job to make your life interesting and to satisfy and to satisfy. Just let them know I'm not here. <laughs> Don't call me at work. You know, you, you, that's what I. That's why I put a. You know, I, I I have a very diverse career because I am always among interesting people who are creating very interesting music, telling you know fantastic stories, and you know my work with Manson's taken me around the world. I've played. You said forty countries last year. Yeah. yeah. Do you prefer that life? What What do you like no. better? The instant gratification of like seeing people enjoying your music, or do you like working in the studio and having something come out later? and 
kind of seeing how it goes. Uh, I like it all. First off, before we cut to that last break, there uh, I think you said Rockstar. No, Rockstar Adjacent. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> it's his name on the ticket, and I'm more than happy to be there just to enjoy playing and to smash it's like the composer on a film you know they're movie stars but the composer's doing a whole huge amount of heavy lifting but it's not tyler bates presents no and and in the watchman and the fans are happy when i'm there they you know i mean when no matter where we are in the world there are always people camped out at our hotels with tons of movie scores for me to sign and whatever but um the experience is is great. It's awesome to walk out and play for 60,000 people. That's so nice. And I really love the fact that you said you've had this variety of experiences, both film composing and playing gigs. I think that that is what makes for a complete life. It's just particularly for a musician. is You're making music in lots of contexts. You're not just the next movie. That's wonderful. I really think that's an admirable approach to well it's humbling making I, music yeah. you, you can look at it one way or the other but for me the opportunity uh to go out and play you know on a month-long tour you know in front of tons of people is it's cool but it also makes me very appreciative of the things i miss because i leave the studio and i have ptsd immediately like i'm so like almost like classically conditioned into writing and producing music every day i start to freak out when i'm not here and of course my family they're amazing and they've been very very supportive so it's a it's a pretty rare life when back in the day i played probably 1200 shows and then i was not touring for 17 years <laughs> and then all of a sudden <laughs> quick break and all of a sudden you know there i am you know much later in life and we're playing for 50,000 people and they're screaming back we know where you fucking live which is the first <laughs> song that came off the record oh, you know wow. and, it's pretty crazy, but uh, <laughs> you just stamped our first explicit episode. I think. <laughs> well, I, you know, I got a parental advisory on the Deadpool score soundtrack. No nice. way! Yeah, not the, not the song soundtrack. It's the score soundtrack. So we're, I'm super proud of that because the <laughs> guitar viol no, is, no, no, is no. raunchy. Do we have and to wait and see? And it's not just because of the titles of the cues. That's all. Okay. That's Man. all I'm going to say. I think you're selling records just by <laughs> by telling us that. Now I got to go get one. I'm telling you, there it, it's a it's the byproduct of an an awesome uh, just an awesome moment that happened during scoring, and um, David oh, David Leach is involved obviously, and in, and what transpired, but it was really fun, <laughs> really fun. Well, I certainly look forward to that. Uh, the movie comes out May 18th, so. Uh, We'll be anticipating that. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, it's your chance to win another prize for all the listeners. Uh, we're going to play Name That Score. We're going to play, I'm sorry, what did you say we're going to play? Name, Name that, that Score, right after this. Hey, Matt Schrader here, director of Score, of film music documentary. For the latest news from the film music world, follow us on Facebook. Just search Score, a film music documentary. Or let us know who you want to hear next on the show on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. We're back here with our guest this week, Tyler Bates. We were just talking Deadpool coming out May 18th. Pumped for that. And he was dropping a deep tease on uh, the score being rated. Score album. Explicit on the score. It's explicit music, I... so keep your children's ears covered. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, and you know how busy Tyler is. He's got The Punisher on uh, Netflix. The phones are ringing off the hook in here, so... <laughs> We got to finish up quickly before he starts his next game. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, it is it's, it's pretty crazy. Thanks for making yeah. the time with us. It's been it's been great. And really uh, great. we're we're now going to jump into the game. It's it's sweeping social media. It's time for a chance to win a prize. Get ready to play Name That Score. The film music game where a perfect score means you, yes you, could be a winner. Now let's play Name That Score! All right. 
So, uh, Tyler, you've scored a couple movies that take place in space. That's our theme of today's game is space movies. So the way this works, uh, the rules of the game are pretty simple. We'll play five famous film scores, but in reverse, uh, Robert, Kenny, and Tyler Bates will pick from three multiple choice answers. The highest score wins. The last question is worth double. If anybody gets them all, we give away a prize. We might give away a prize anyway. And today's theme is space movies. Nice. I will give you the options. Is it easier if I give you the options first instead of playing the first? Uh... Oh, I think options first gives it's us. It's probably better for the listeners to okay, so, so they get a chance. Question one. Is this a clip from Gravity by Stephen Price, Battlestar Galactica by Bear McCreary, or Interstellar by Hans Zimmer? I should warn you that I usually wait for the composer to say it first so I can mimic your answer because I think I have no idea. So whatever you say, I usually I've, think. I've seen only one of those movies. I do know that uh, I heard that Hans Zimmer used uh, an organ pretty heavily in Interstellar. That would be my guess. It sounded organ-like. I, I'm going to agree with that. I I have no choice but <laughs> to agree. agree. <laughs> How do we do? Everybody gets points for that one. It is. All right, so the next one, Robert, you're going first on the next one. Is this we, it? It's an organ? It's Interstellar? Or was that the last one? <laughs> this is this is the, the forwards version of what we just heard. Darn. Okay, so points for everybody on that one, and we will move on to question two. Is this, and again, the theme is space movie uh, film scores, Star Wars by John Williams, Star Trek, the motion picture, Jerry Goldsmith, or Apollo 13 by James Horner? Oh, I just heard it. Then we, we should go. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with Star Trek. Candy says Star Trek. Yep, I'm with you. I'm Everybody's with you going too. Star I'm, Trek. I'm Star Trekking. Points for everybody again. It is Star Trek. Let's hear it. Can I, can I just explode our social media really quick <laughs> and admit that I've never seen one Star Trek oh, thing geez. ever? Oh, jeez. Okay. What cards and letters direct them to <laughs> Kenny Holmes? Well, I just, I, I, I'm, you know, I feel like some of that stuff is like your parents pass it down to you, or your oh older boy, all right, all something. right, we're moving on. Question three, question three. I got to do it. I think. I think I need to jump I in. Think my music would sound better in reverse. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> nice. It might sound pretty cool in reverse. Question three is this: The Martian by Harry Gregson Williams, Wally -E by Thomas Newman, animated film, or Galaxy Quest by David Newman? Robert, I I'm just unbelievably stumped by all of it, but I'm going to say <laughs> something odd because of a musical intuition. I'm going with Wally Thomas Newman for oh, yeah. a musical. I'm with you there. I, I think am. it was kind of the beep, boop, 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 boop. it was more just the the modal tonal mm -hmm. kind of Thomas Newman harmonic sense that even in reverse sounded like mm, that's a very distinct thing. I'm, I'm going with Wally as well. Everybody, yeah. Points for everybody again. Right on. Robert Kraft's first correct answer before someone else answers. It's really Great job. <laughs> it's so, you know, I paid Matt a little bit. Hey. That's shh. so beautiful. <laughs> that was so beautiful, that cue. All right, question number four. Everybody is uh, three for three so far. Question four. Is this Armageddon by Trevor Rabin, Guardians of the Galaxy, Tyler Bates, or Contact by Alan Silvestri? Robert. <laughs> yes. Robert's, Robert's pointing. So he gets caught pointing at there. Put That's the man so on the spot. <laughs> I am going to really, first of all, it's going to be embarrassing if it's Tyler because he's sitting across from me and I'm going to not know that that was a cue backwards. I feel Trevor Rabin coming through in Armageddon. Please, God, am I guessing incorrectly. Next Can batter. I saw Tyler really light up there for a second oh uh, so, see they're looking at you tyler <laughs> this is, this is but, uh, but maybe he was i don't know i've been led to believe that uh, i was right and it was i got duped so but i'm i'm gonna go with uh tyler bates on that okay <laughs> 
Tyler, do you do you know the answer to this? Yeah, I'll go with Tyler Bates. <laughs> oh, you guys are just embarrassing me. That's what you're doing. Winner, two winners, uh, Tyler and Kenny both got uh, <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy, and uh, Robert. Thank you so much. Our you know, first loss. Our first. Uh, uh, our first loser. Answer. Our first. Loser. What did you think, Tyler? You said you'd like to hear your music backwards. Yeah, I, let's hear it forwards. I'm I'm into it. <laughs> this is forwards, of course, with the uh, the vocals. Oh, well, that's again. Nice. It's just a great theme. Love it. All right. I question knew it was Tyler. five. I just you know, kind of playing <laughs> shy. <laughs> You're just trying to keep it interesting around that's here. Right. Question number five. This one's worth a double. So, uh, Robert, you still have a chance to win if you right get on. this right, but you need two incorrect answers from the other two guys here. So, Fellas. question five. Is this Alien, Jerry Goldsmith, Moon by Clint Manziel, or Independence Day by David Arnold? Oh, man. I That's have a brutal. guess. Go ahead. You, you're. Uh, I'm going to guess because why not? I'm a loser <laughs> anyway. So, I worked on Independence Day with David Arnold, and I don't hear one note of that. I don't know if that's Jerry's Alien, and since I have no idea what Clint Mansell's Moon sounds like, but I know Clint Mansell's vibey approach, I've deduced. I'm going with Clint and Moon. Guaranteed, it's wrong, but that's my guess. Robert's going with Clint Mansell. Okay. I'm going to go Jerry Goldsmith. Jerry Goldsmith says Kenny. And I'm, Tyler, the options again, Alien, Moon, and Independence Day. I, I'm going with Robert on this one. Going with Robert. Go down the rabbit hole. All right. So Robert and Tyler both get that. Oh, Kenny. Oh, man. That means I got third place? Yep. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. So again, uh, Tyler is uh, our guest. Our, our composer guests are almost perfect in all of these games. Uh, and uh, Tyler, again, a perfect score in this. Yeah, see? All right. We'll play Amazing. our outro. Congratulations, I don't know. I don't Tyler. I know how this happened. Always, well. always in the break. I'm not going to be good at this. <laughs> so clean sweep. Perfect. Um, uh, I do want to ask you one, one quick uh, final question here that just kind of popped in. Um, when you walk into Disneyland now, you're cemented forever, or at least for a long period of time, into this Guardians of the Galaxy ride. I guess it's California Adventure. What is that like for you to to know? I mean, you've got kids. You get to you're going to have family for right. years on, going hundreds of millions of people really coming through. And you're there. part of this 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 world of Guardians of the Galaxy, and your music's in the ride. Like, what's that like for you? It's it's well it's interesting the working with the Disney Imagineering was awesome. Yeah, all the meetings are after midnight, you know, cuz they have to shut down the the ride after all the oh, the public wow. leaves. You know, they never turn off the lights or the music in Disneyland. Interesting. Oh. Um but anyway, it was it was great working with them and uh then we were fortunate enough to do a special uh Halloween edition <laughs> um where the music on the ride is like a thrash punk song that i did and so it's actually me singing and oh no nice. <laughs> it's hilarious um <laughs> but it, it's really cool i'm not a big legacy type person you know i believe in, in living in in uh learning from the past living in now and and hopefully setting the table for a decent future if, mm -hmm. if i'm here but uh all i can say is it was a great pleasure to work with the the people you know i know that I'm just a pixel in the Guardians of the Galaxy realm, and <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy is a pixel in the Marvel universe. So to be part of it is a privilege, and uh, and to work with the people was a fantastic experience. So that was cool. Um, I'm not complaining about it by any stretch. <laughs> so it was another really interesting dimension to the things that have occurred in my life in the past. You know, and I imagine we'll continue to. These kind of interesting experiences don't one day stop. They just multiply, and just sounds like what's coming up will be equally interesting. Yeah, again, Deadpool 2 coming out in just a couple of weeks. Um, I want to quickly thank Tyler for having us. I know you're super busy. Uh, a reminder to our listeners, um, tell a friend, 
uh, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And even uh, leave a review if you have the time to do so. A and nice one. Make sure to follow us on Score the Podcast's uh, Twitter, at Score the Podcast. We're giving away a prize this week because Tyler Bates ran the table. Yeah. He really did. And he, even after saying, I won't be good at this, I have to take home the fact that I heard a Tyler Bates cue backwards and didn't identify it, but I will <laughs> hopefully make up for it. Matt, thanks for running the board. Tyler, thanks for being here. Kenny, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody next week. 